Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum dear participants. Welcome to this session of uh, Mizan lecture series. So, as you all know that this is a series in which we are covering Ustaz Javed Ahmed Ghamadi's treatise Mizan, which actually is his understanding of the Quran. Uh, we have covered a major portion of the social sharia, which was in dis discussion since the last many weeks. Today, or maybe the, in the next session, uh, we will be ending uh, this chapter of the social sharia of uh, of Islam and uh, we will also uh, have been discussing the fact that as far as these uh, chapters are concerned they are not being taught in the order that they are found in the book but once we have finished this uh, teaching of the whole book they will be arranged in the same order as they are found in the book. So uh, some of the portions that we will discuss today uh, relate to some of the areas that have are uh, now left for the social sharia to be covered. They include directives relating to widows, uh, directives relating to parents, directives relating to orphans, and finally, the issue of slavery. So let us start off with the first of these, and this is directives relating to widows. Uh, I'm going to read out a translation of uh, the text of the verses that is being displayed before you. These are verses 234 and 235 of Surah Baqarah. And those of you who die, and leave behind widows, they should keep themselves in waiting for four months and ten days. <laughs> then when they have fulfilled their term, there is no blame on you about what they do with themselves in accordance with the norms of society. And Allah is well acquainted with what they do. And there is also no blame on you if you tacitly send a marriage proposal to these women or hold it in your hearts. Allah knows that you would soon talk to them. Do so, but do not make a secret promise. Of course, you can say something in accordance with the norms of society, and do not decide to marry till the law reaches its term. And know that Allah is not, is, has knowledge of what, you, what is in your hearts. So be fearful of Him, and know that Allah is most forgiving and most forbearing. So these are the directives that the Quran has mentioned uh, regarding widows and as you can see that they are based on certain principles and we will try to discuss all these principles. The first thing which is mentioned is that the iddat of a widow is four months and ten days. In contrast to the iddat of a divorced lady, the iddat of a widow has been extended by 40 days. So we know that the iddat of a divorced lady is 90 days or three months. But in the case of a uh, widow, as you can see from these verses, it is extended by 40 days. And it is 4 months and 10 days in net. The reason is that while a husband has been asked to divorce his wife in the period of purity in which he has had no sexual intercourse with her, obviously no such requirement can be proposed in the case of a widow. It is to exercise care that 40 days have been added by the Quran to the waiting period of a woman who loses her husband. So one distinction which these verses make is that as far as a widow is concerned, because of course no such proposition can be made vis-a-vis uh, -vis having intercourse with her during her period of purity, then her husband can die anytime. Uh, and therefore in this regard, the amount of uh, the waiting period or the extent of the waiting period has been increased by 40 days. The second thing is stated that after the waiting period expires, the wife is free to do whatever she deems appropriate for herself. But she should follow the norms of the society in this matter. In other words, she should not indulge in any activity which damages the repute, honor and integrity of the family, nor the norms of society. If all this is kept in, in mind, then no blame can be cast on her or her guardians. So as far as she is concerned, she is free to do uh, whatever she's, she likes to do. But in this regard, she should also uh, give full regard to the fact that as far as she is concerned, she is living in a house of mourning, if she is living in the house of, his, uh, of her husband. And she must not do something uh, which should be uh, against these norms in, in any way. She has to respect this mourning period. And to be honest, uh, today this respect is automatically there. Uh, in the Arabian society, uh, this was uh, something which was... Uh, which had a slightly different uh, scenario, and that was that women would often marry again, and uh, the mourning period at times 
would be in a situation in which they would be thinking of marrying a second husband or, or a next husband. And in this way, uh, this could have undermined in any way the, uh, the whole issue. So therefore, they are being asked to exercise caution in this regard. If you note that the third thing which is stated here is that if a person wants to marry a widow, then it is according to the norms that he take this decision in his mind during her iddat or inform her of his intentions in a very tacit way. It is not permitted that he, without considering the sentiments of the affected family, send a marriage proposal to the widow or make some hidden agreement with her. On such occasions, whatever is said must never exceed the bounds of sympathy and expression of condolences. So the verses forewarn a person then that since it is definite that he would express his intention in such a situation, it should not be in the form of a marriage proposal or some hidden or open agreement. This intention should be ex expressed in a manner that is befitting to the situation and also in accordance with the norms and conventions of the society that he is living in. Of course, once the waiting period or the idhid period expires, a person can decide to marry such a lady. At that time, he cannot be blamed in any way. It stems from this directive that the behavior of the widow also should be befitting to the situation she finds herself in, as uh, we have just discussed. And on these very grounds, uh, the Prophet has directed such women to spend their iddat in the house of their deceased husband in a state of mourning and to refrain from embellishing themselves. So, uh, the Prophet is supposed to have said, A widow should not wear colored clothes neither golden nor red nor ochre, nor should she adorn jewelry, nor put on henna or stain her eyes with antimony. Of course, this is something which, uh, as I said, this normally doesn't happen in the subcontinent or in most uh, Muslim countries today. But in Arabia, this was something that had to be told to the to Arab ladies because, as I, as I just pointed out, that they would be generally planning to marry again. So they would always be uh, trying to look their best and they would adorn jewelry and they would wear uh, clothes that would be uh, that would of course be befitting for their own personalities. So the Quran is cautioned here that as far as a as a widow is concerned, she should respect the sentiments. But at the same time, viewers, this does not mean that she in any way has to contain herself in the house as is generally understood. A widow, if especially if she's an elderly lady, she has all the right to travel, to go to various places, even to visit parks or any entertainment, because this is the time when she needs this entertainment and amusement the most. She needs to divert her attention. So, especially in the subcontinent where the custom is that the widows are not allowed to go out in the, the period, this is absolutely baseless. It has no basis in religion. Neither is it uh, befitting, nor is it in any way conducive to her own situation. She can... Uh, of course, respect the sentiments, but uh, keeping those sentiments in view, she can carry out all her chores, she can visit people, she can uh, do any professional work that she might be doing. Obviously, uh, this state of mourning is something which comes naturally. And as far as it comes naturally, she would behave uh, in, in, a in a manner which is also quite natural. So no other restriction must be imposed by the, by the, by the heirs of the deceased uh, husband or by the family members, they must understand that a widow, uh, in this regard, if she has to uh, remain uh, cautious, then that is only as far as she needs to respect the sentiments of the family of her deceased husband. That is all. Other than that, she has the liberty to, to uh, undertake all the tasks that she is doing. She might be a professional lady. She might be someone who is doing some tasks. He, she might be having a job at her hand. All these things. You know, there is no restriction which Islam lays on her. And all the uh, stipulations which exist in a, in, for a divorced lady also will, will automatically and analogously also be understood to be present in the case of a widowed lady. For example, if a widowed lady is pregnant, then her iddat will extend until childbirth. And uh, once this childbirth has taken place, she will, have, she will not be required to observe any iddat. And if a doctor certifies that she is not pregnant, then we also need to note that she does not need to observe the iddat at all, because iddat or the waiting period is primarily for her to, for the society to know whether she is expecting a baby or not, whether she is conceived or not. If there is no such thing, then whether it's a divorced lady or, as we have just uh, been studying here, 
the case of a widowed lady, then there is absolutely no iddat in the first place. The directives of these iddat which we are discussing, they relate to when that iddat has to be observed. But when she is not pregnant in any way, it can be confirmed by a doctor, then this period in itself is something which, has, which can be overlooked, which can be uh, ignored, and she can marry uh, as soon as she likes. Another thing which has been mentioned in the Quran in this regard is that as far as the, uh, as the, Quran, as the wife is concerned, she should be provided with residence and maintenance during this period. The Quran has answered this question in, in, uh, in the surah and it has actually bound the husband that they should make a will in favor of their wives for the provision of one year's residence and maintenance, except if the wives themselves leave the house or take some other step, like for example, if they marry someone else. Otherwise, uh, it is bound on every husband to make a will in favor of his wife and, uh, and in no, not so many words, he must clearly tell his family, his heirs, that for one year, for one year, she should be provided with residence and maintenance. So this is in fact an extension of the responsibility of the husband as the head of the family. So we know that as the head of the family, a husband is required to maintain his wife, to support her financially. And after he passes away, this support, the Quran says, should extend by one year so that a wife uh, could have some alternative for that one year. And if she has something uh, after that, that she can do, it should be that she's not left in the lurch. She's not left high and dry as soon as the husband passes away. And for one year, the husband is required to already make that amount available for her that as soon as he dies for one year, the amount that is needed to sustain her whether it's her residence or whether it is a financial uh, requirement, both will be fulfilled. And I dare say, dear viewers, that this is, this is one directive of the Quran that uh, we need to revisit and we need to uh, acquaint ourselves with because we see that today many uh, people have forgotten this directive. And one reason for this forgetfulness may be that they are scholars who believe that this directive has been revoked. Uh, because in the law of inheritance, the wife has been given a share and they think that the share which the wife has been given actually revokes uh, this, this verse, which is actually not true. The inheritance that a wife gets is because of a benefit which the Quran has said that is potentially given to the husband. As far as this is concerned, this is a extension of the financial responsibility of the husband so that for one year, that support and maintenance for which he was liable to in, the, in his own lifetime is extended. So this is very important. And let me now read out this verse which says, and those of you who die and leave widows should bequeath for their widows a year's provision and bequeath that in this period, they, should, they shall not be turned out of their residences. But if they themselves leave the residences, there is no blame on you for what they do with themselves according to the norms of society. And Allah is exalted in power. So clearly we can see that the rights of a widow, which the Quran has mentioned, they have to be honored in, all, uh, in every respect. And we have already discussed this under the divorced uh, the laws that we were discussing earlier on, that there are stipulations which will carry on with the widowed lady as they, are, as they exist in, uh, in the case of a divorced lady. And one of those stipulations is that uh, if a widow wants to marry uh, someone else than the heirs of the of the deceased husband should not in any way cause an impediment. They should not cause a hindrance because it is a free will to do so. And something which is a free will has to be exercised. It is a given. And in all circumstances, the Quran has given her liberty to choose her, her second husband if she wants to. It could be that, of course, uh, as far as Iddat is concerned, uh, she might uh, like to continue the way she is. She might not like to marry because of her children. But remember, this is something which also relates to a lot of cultural implications. There are cultures in which a second marriage by a widow is considered to be a, no less than an anathema or even a sin. But of course, this is not the purpose of religion. It wants people to live the way they would like to live. There are women who would like to live alone once their husband passes, or passes away or their husband passes away. They would devote themselves to their children. But there are others who would like to marry. And uh, in, in both cases, the choice must be made by her and the society, especially the society's elders and the elders of the family that she is part of, must facilitate what she wants and not impose their 
view on the widow. Now, viewers, we'll come to the next uh, topic that we will discuss, and that relates to the to the directives which relate to parents. I am just going to read out the translation uh, of uh, these verses. Though. So these are verses 14 and 15 of uh, Surah Luqman, the 31st Surah. And then we have another section of verses from Surah Bani Israel, which is verse 23 to 25. I'm just going to read out the translations of both these section of verses. Now, first we will look at Surah Luqman. And we enjoin man to show kindness to his parents. With much pain his mother bears him, and he is not weaned before he is two years of age. We said, Be grateful to me and to your parents. To me shall all things return. But if they press you to serve besides me that of which you have no knowledge, do not obey them. Remain kind to them in this world, and turn to me with all devotion. To me you shall all return, and I will declare to you everything you have uh, you have done so this is the first uh, section of verses regarding the directives which relate to parents now we move on to the next and this is uh, these are verses 23 to 25 of surah bani israel the 17th surah and they read and your lord has enjoined you to worship none but him and to show great kindness to your parents if either or both of them attain old age in your presence show them no sign of impatience nor rebuke them but speak to them with kind words, treat them with humility and tenderness, and say, Lord, be merciful to them the way they nursed me when I was an infant. Your Lord knows best what is in your hearts. If you remain steadfast, if you remain obedient, he will forgive those who turn to him. So this is the summary of the directives that you can see relate to uh, to parents and they have to understand that as far as the Quran is concerned it has this uh, very important message to give that the parents who give uh, birth to children to the two it they actually are responsible to bring into existence a new life they are a means to nourish it as well so no doubt the care and affection of the father is quite a lot however the hardships a mother encounters in bringing up the child starting from her pregnancy to childbirth and then breastfeeding the child are unmatched and no child can repay her for this very service. And on these very grounds, because pregnancy, childbirth and breastfeeding, these are the three responsibilities which only the mother can fulfill. And precisely because of this that the Prophet has said that a mother's right is thrice that of a father because he of course, provides for the for the child. He looks after for the look, looks after the child in his own way. But the three responsibilities which his wife undertakes are unmatched. So the Almighty exhorts human beings to be the most grateful to their parents after their Lord. The first thing that they have to understand is that their parents have brought them into existence, and this gratitude that they must have for their parents must not be merely expressed by the tongue. It is an essential corollary that they should actually show good behavior towards them and full respect to them and never become fed up uh, from them. Uh, we see that the Quran has said that uh, uh, once your parents reach old age, of course, they become slightly irritable and they, in fact, start to behave like children. It is here that the Quran tells human beings and their children especially that you must be kind to them. You must remember that when you were growing up in their laps, you were an infants who they tended to, who would really make a mess of things. But very patiently, very steadfastly, the mother and the father would look after you. So you now have to repay your father. In fact, you cannot repay them. All that you can do is you must look after them when they reach this old age. And as the Quran says, فَلَا تَكُلَّهُمَا أُفْفِمْ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا that don't show disrespect to them. Now, uh, this word of, uh, I'd like to explain it a little more because of the subcontinent culture and the Urdu language, uh, I mean, it prevails here. The word of has a different meaning in the Arabic language. We know what it means in the Urdu language. It means that you should, must not uh, disobey your parents. But in the Arabic language, it does not mean to disobey parents. It actually means to show disrespect. So, as, as far as the Quran is concerned, it says that you must not show disrespect to your parents, you must not scold them. Obedience to the parents is not mentioned anywhere in the Quran. 
what the Quran has said regarding parents is Wabil Walidaini Ihsana, as we have just seen in the verses that we've studied of Surah Bani Israel. So the right of the parents is not that we have to show obedience to them. This is something which is erroneously understood, not at a single place in the Quran has obedience been ever mentioned regarding parents. What is mentioned all the while is that you have to be kind to them, you have to be considerate to them, you must be sympathetic to them, you must not scold them, you must not be disrespectful uh, to them. You must, as, the, as this verse says, treat them with humility and tenderness. And then, as the beautiful uh, dua which is taught in, this, uh, in these verses of Surah Bani Israel, you must utter these words for them. Rabbir hamhuma kama rabbayani sagira. Lord, be kind to them the way they have nursed me when we were young or when I was young. So, this is what the rights of the parents are. And I will take a little more time to explain this because this is one of the major causes of misconception amongst people, especially uh, in Muslim cultures. They think that the parents have unlimited rights over their children. So, parents generally impose their views on their children. They would like to do I mean, they would like to select the career of their children. They would like to select the spouse of their children. They would uh, more often than not interfere in all major decisions which the children take. And they think that the children must follow their own decision. This is absolutely incorrect. And not only is it incorrect, it is against human rights as well. The Quran gives these human rights to every single adult child that once he or she enters that adulthood, then he or she is singularly responsible for any decision that she or he would like to take. Yes, the, the, the parents can share their experience. They can uh, divulge anything that they might think is a cause of concern from them. They can even go as far as to say that, well, son or daughter, if you're taking such this decision, uh, you might be facing such and such situations which you might not like. But if the children uh, or the son or the daughter insist on a decision in spite of your advice, in, in spite of our advice, then they must support them, although they might differ with that decision, but they should stand back. They should not act as uh, spoil sports, I would say. And for example, say that you are going to marry such and such a, a girl or a boy. I'm not going to be part of your wedding or I'm not going to be part of the whole uh, ceremony. That is not correct. That's not the correct way. Because you see, as far as taking all major decisions, and I think one of the major decisions is choosing a life partner. So you can see in the whole corpus of the Quran, as far as uh, decision making is concerned, the Quran has left it to every individual. And that individual, whether, uh, whatever, whatever the, the view that that individual might take, has the right to completely, independently, with full freedom of choice, take that decision. Uh, I would again say that in this regard, as children, of course, they must show respect to their, their, to their parents. They should not be disrespectful. And they can always be stern without being harsh. Yes, they can be stern without being harsh. They can take a stand, but they should not be harsh. And at the same time, they must also realize and lend an ear to the advice that their ch parents are actually giving, giving them. Because uh, advice, such advice is based on experience is based on wisdom, in fact, practical wisdom. So in all earnest, they must uh, give a very deep thought to the opinion of their parents. Yes, they have the liberty to take a decision, but it should be after they consider very wholeheartedly the advice and the choice of their parents. So this is what the children must do. On the other hand, the parents, they should give that advice and then stand back, as I said. They must not enforce their view because if they do so, then they would be uh, they would be stepping against i mean they would be uh, crossing the limits which god has set because god has given every individual the right to live his or her own life the time to be uh, if i can use the word vindictive for the parents the, and that too in a very very uh, specific sense that that was the time when the child was growing up and he or she would not consider that harshness to be something of an insult which of course adult children do so in such situations you can impose some of your uh, choices and that too in, in a very prudent way but once a child has attained adult age once he or she becomes an individual in his own right or her own right then she has the the ability and she has the authority and the prerogative to take any decision as i said i'm just going to repeat what i said earlier on because this is extremely important to hear 
that the decision taken by the children could be absolutely wrong. This could be, in, in the view of the parents, it could be totally wrong. But what they need to do is that they should just convey their concern. Because at the end of the day, there are certain things in this world which are only learnt after mistakes are made. We should look upon our own selves that when we were growing up as parents, we made mistakes and we learned from our mistakes. And we would not listen to our parents in spite of the fact that they would impress upon us certain things. So there are certain things which can only be learned through practice and experience. Uh, there are certain mistakes which we are bound to make in order to rectify them in future. And we should uh, make this uh, a point with us that as far as adult individuals are concerned, as parents are concerned, this is what we should do, that we should make develop this friendship with them. We should try to make uh, ourselves very close and come close to our, to our children. We should spend quality time with them. We should be uh, friends to them, but in no way should we vindictive. There is a method to everyone. In fact, as the, uh, the Quranic verses of Surah Bani Israel have just said, that if they insist you to do polytheism, to indulge in polytheism, the, the Quran says you must not follow them. But in spite of that, sahib mafid dunya marufa, you must treat them with kindness. So even parents who indulge in polytheism, even parents who uh, commit a sin which is as heinous as polytheism, we know it is an unforgivable sin before the Almighty if it is done intentionally. So even for such a sin, the Almighty says that if your parents are doing something of this sort, you might you should not follow them, of course, but at the same time, do not scold them, be sympathetic to them. And Sahib Humafid Dunya Marufa, which is a very emphatic statement, that deal very affectionately with them uh, in this world. Because what they're doing is between them and God, and He'll take account from them. But as far as you are concerned, as children, even if they are indulging in polytheism, your duty is to be good and kind to them. And this is a very powerful message of the Quran, I think, that we should understand as parents. And it is something that we also must uh, marvel at because this is the beauty of religion that in spite of the fact that the Almighty says that polytheism or shirk is something that he'll not forgive, but at the same time he says that if parents are indulging in such a thing, that is a belief which might really have to, I mean, they, they will pay heavily for that. But that doesn't mean that the children should be harsh with them or the children should disobey them. Their rights as a parent still stand. They still stand in spite of their, uh, their vividness. And I think that it is here that the Quran has made this very emphatic statement. It has given a very powerful statement. And on the other hand, we need to understand that this narrative that many Muslim societies today nurture in themselves, that children have to be obedient to their parents, is a, is a goner, is something which is not found in the Quran or in any authentic narrative. Though the Quran, what the right of a parent which the Quran mentions foremost is, be kind to them, be considerate to them, be sympathetic to them. But never ever has it said that you have to be obedient to your parents. This is something that we have to realize. Viewers, now next move on to the next part. Uh, and uh, in this regard also, uh, let me just, before we move on to the next part, uh, add one more thing that uh, the, the, the Prophet has reported these words, and this is basically an extension of, of what we have just said, that if the parents ask you to do something which is, uh, which is like, like shirk, which is like polytheism, or if we analogously think that anything which is against religion, then you no, should not in any way follow them. Because as, as this narrative, which I just read out, that itaat or obedience is only in case of of virtue, not in case of any sin or something which is against religion. So no one can be obeyed if he calls to disobey the Almighty. One can only obey what is virtuous. In namatara fil maruf, and this therefore has to be understood that as far as the right of a parent is concerned, it if you are not uh, if you are not following them, for example, if they are asking you to do polytheism, then it is but natural because they are indulging in something which the Almighty has forbidden. Next, we move on to the right of the orphans. And once again, I'm going to read out the translation of these verses. Uh, these verses are actually from Surah Nisa. These are verses 2 to 10. And uh, I'm going to read out. This is a, a slightly longer passage. And uh, we, uh, we should let's carefully hear, to this, uh, hear this passage out because on this passage uh, depends some part of the verses 
uh, or, or the rights, I would say, that are found in the Quran regarding orphans. So uh, this is verse number two of Surah Nisa. It says, and give the, the orphans the wealth which belongs to them. Neither exchange their valuables for, for your worthless ones, nor devour their wealth by mixing it with yours. Indeed, this is a great sin. And if you fear that you cannot treat orphans equitably, then you may marry their mothers who are lawful to you. 223344. Three, four. But if you fear that you cannot maintain equality among them, marry one only or any slave girls you may own. This will make it easier for you to avoid injustice. And give these women also their dower the way it is given. But if they choose to give to you a part of it, you may consume it willingly. And if the orphan is naive and mentally immature as yet, do not give to these immature the wealth with which Allah has entrusted you for their sustenance and support. But feed and clothe them with its proceeds and say words of kindness to them. And keep judging these orphans until they reach a marriageable age. Then, if you find them capable of sound judgment, hand over their wealth to them and do not devour it by squandering it and consuming it hastily, fearing that they would soon come of age. And let the guardian of the orphan who is rich abstain from his wealth, and the guardian who is poor uh, eat from it in lieu of the service or, or in lieu of his service according to the norms of society. Then, when you hand over their wealth to them, call in some witnesses, and Allah alone suffices to take account of all your actions. Men shall have a share in what their parents and kinsmen leave, and women shall have a share in what their, kin, uh, in what their parents and kinsmen leave, whether this legacy be little or much, as in a certain amount. However, if relatives, orphans, or the needy who happen to come by at the division of an inheritance, give them to a share of it and speak to them kind words. And those people should fear that if they themselves would have left their young children after their own death, they would have been very anxious. For this reason, fear Allah and speak for justice in every matter. Undoubtedly, those who unjustly devour the wealth of orphans swallow fire into their bellies, and soon they shall burn in the flames of hell. So these are the directives which are mentioned as far as uh, uh, the uh, the orphans are concerned. Now, we remember that orphans are one of the weakest sections of our society. And the Quran has referred to the welfare of the orphans and to the attitude of kindness and affection that it should be adopted towards them in without any, any, uh, without any discrimination. And this is something which it has consistently done at various instances. But in these verses of Surah Nisa, there are certain very specific directives which are given about them. And we would, we would need to note down and understand these directives. So the first thing which is said is that the guardians of the orphans should return their wealth to them and should not think of devouring it themselves. They should know that unjustly consuming the wealth of orphans is like filling one's belly with fire. This will lead them to the fire of hell as well in the hereafter. No one should try to swap his poor merchandise and assets for their good ones. Neither should a person try to benefit from their wealth while mixing it with his own feigning administrative ease. If such intermingling, intermingling needs to be done, it should be only be for the orphan's welfare and well-being and not to usurp their wealth in any way. So you, as far as their guardians are concerned, because these are guardians of the orphans, they must not consume their wealth. The Quran has said the only way to do that is that if the guardian of the orphan is, is poor, then yes, he can consume part of the wealth as administrative expenses or the time that he has given because he himself was in need. So the Quran has said that you can benefit. Uh, if, the, if, the, if the heir or the guardian is weak, is poor, then he can consume some, some part of the wealth. But if he is, is well off, then he should not do so. And the Quran has said that as soon as they reach this maturity, 
as soon as they reach maturity, they must give, be given back that wealth to them because this is something which belonged to them. And as guardians of, of these orphans, it was in their custody. It was a big thing that was entrusted to them. They were custodians of their wealth and they must never be dis dishonest in this custodianship. The second thing which is mentioned here is that protecting the orphans' wealth and safeguarding their rights, they are significant responsibilities. And if it becomes difficult to fulfill these responsibilities alone, and people think that ease and facility can be created by involving the mothers of the orphans, then they can marry the lawful among them. So the Quran is given the second choice because at times looking after these orphans is not that easy. And if their mothers are married, of course, they have the foremost interest with their children. So in this way, you can look after those orphans very well. And also, of course, a widowed lady, uh, that would be someone also that they would be looking after. So this is like a double uh, virtue that they would be earning. So if, uh, if it would be more easier for them in this regard, then this is an option which the Quran has, has said. But in this regard, it has given certain stipulations. And these stipulations are that remember that as far as marrying uh, women for this cause, uh, of the mothers of the orphans, uh, then in this case also a dower should be given to that to that lady. And thinking that you're doing doing an act of virtue, this should not nullify the fact that you stop giving or you don't give that dower to her. That that is her right. Remember, a dower holds a very important symbolic significance, and that is that this dower is basically a symbolic expression of the fact that the husband is going to financially support the wife for the as long as they are going to be married. So the dower is basically that symbolic token that she gives, that he gives at the time of marriage. And we have discussed this earlier on, that in the fitness of things, it must be paid at the time of marriage, because this, basically this expresses the husband's willingness that he is going to take care of the financial responsibilities of the wife. And it can in no way be revoked in this case also, thinking that you are doing a deed, a favor, to these orphans, the Quran says, no, you must do that as well. Then it has also said that we, you, this for this noble cause also, if you have to marry, then you should not exceed more than four wives, more than four times. And that too, if you are absolutely certain that you would be able to do justice with the wives. And this justice, of course, doesn't mean that uh, it has to be the justice of the heart. You can love more wife, uh, one wife more than the other. Uh, this is something which relates to the heart and the Quran. In a later verse in Surah Nisa has also specified this, that justice does not mean equal love. It actually means equal rights given to all the wives. But if the husband or the person fears that he would not be able to do justice with the wives, then the Quran says that you should not go beyond a single wife. And since in those times, we have also discussed this earlier on, and we shall discuss this in our last session, inshallah, uh, in regard to this chapter, that uh, slavery in those times was rampant. And so therefore, the Quran says that you must confine yourselves to one wife and to the slave girl that you are slave women that you might be owning. We have discussed this and earlier on and we'll discuss this uh, later also that Islam inherited the institution of slavery and it gradually uh, did away with this institution. And on, it only took a certain amount of time because slavery was deeply grounded in, Arab, in the Arabian society. And so therefore, uh, it was given a certain amount of time and uh, right at the end of the Prophet's ministry, uh, the, the Surah Nur verse totally revoked, revoked slavery and it said that any slave or man or woman who does mukatibat uh, would be required to be set free or emancipated if he or she wants to do that. But we'll discuss more that more, more on this in the, in the next section, which is the last section of this chapter. But as far as these verses are, con are concerned, the point that is being made here is that as far as the welfare of the orphans is concerned, then even for an objective as noble as the welfare of the orphans, they cannot marry more than one if justice cannot be dispensed. Because justice is a virtue that must reign supreme. And while entering into the marriage, the mothers of the orphans must be respected. They must be given full respect. It should not be as if a favor is being done and therefore some let off is allowed in this case. This is not, this is not a correct understanding. The pretext that marriage has been contracted with them for the welfare of their own children is not acceptable in this regard. If, a, if however, as the Quran says, in the case of the dower, if a mother gladly forgoes a portion or the total amount of the dower, which is the meher, 
then of course this generosity can be accepted. So as far as the husband is concerned, he must pay the full dower or the meher. But if the wife herself gladly foregoes a part of it or even a total of it, the Quran is, itself has said, has said here, then there is no uh, there is no harm in accepting this or benefiting from this generosity. The third thing which is said in these verses is that wealth is a means of sustenance and subsistence for people. It should not be wasted. The directive of returning to orphans their money should be carried out when they reach maturity and are able to properly manage their wealth. Prior to this, it should remain in the protection of their guardians who should continue to judge the orphans regarding their ability to manage and handle, uh, uh, handle the affairs. The, the Quranic words used are that you keep assessing them until they reach that manageable age. Because this is like being entrusted uh, with not only their persons but also with their money. In this interim period, the orphans' needs should be provided for. And it, it should not be that this, they start hastily consuming, the gardens start hastily consuming the wealth of the orphans, fearing that they will lose access to this wealth because the orphans will soon reach maturity. This would be a very horrific scenario. In addition, the gardens must take note to speak very affectionately to the orphans. Kurulahum kaulam marufa, the Quran says. Kurulahum kaulam marufa, speak to them very affectionately. This is something which is also underscored at many instances in the Quran that remember the, these are the underprivileged sections of the society. They have lost their fathers and as a result, they need to be taken care of. And the most important thing is that you must never damage their self-respect. And something which damages their self-respect is to speak them in a way that compromises their self-respect and you are harsh to them. The fourth thing which is mentioned here is that a guardian who is well off, he should not take anything from the orphan in return for his service. And if he's poor, he should take whatever he can according to the norms of society. I have already discussed this earlier on, that yes, he can do that. But as far as a guardian who is, a, who is well off is concerned, he should not take, take any amount. He should do this as a favor. The fifth point which is, uh, which is discussed here in these verses is that when the time comes to hand over an orphan his wealth, then some trustworthy and reliable people should be made witnesses the Quran says, makes people witnesses. So that, uh, when you give these, this, these, uh, this wealth back to, their, to these orphans, when they grow up, then it should be witnessed by people. So that everything is done in order and there is nothing which can cause any dispute or dissension. We should remember that one day this account shall be presented before the Almighty. He sees and knows all things and nothing can be hidden from him. The sixth thing which is mentioned in these verses is that the shares of these heirs uh, of the heirs to a deceased are fixed. Yet, if the time at the time of distribution of inheritance, some close, poor orphans or relatives happen to come by, happen to chance by, then even though they may not have any legal right in the inheritance, they should be given something, and and they should be spoken in a very befitting manner at their departure. On such occasions, a person should always keep in mind that his own children can become orphans and he may one day have to similarly leave them at the mercy of others. So if they happen to chance by when this distribution is taking place, even though they don't have any legal right in that wealth, even then something should be given to them and that too in a very, very befitting way and they must be talked with in a very affectionate way. So this brings us to an end to today's uh, session. Now just one topic remains in the social sharia, which is the topic of slavery. With this we will cover inshallah in our next uh, gathering which relates to the uh, Mizan study series and uh, as far as uh, this, this topic is concerned we can now call it a day and if you have any questions regarding what we have just covered please raise them. Thank you very much Dr. Salim. Shaban Ansari please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum uh, Dr. واقعی پیرنٹس کے معاملے میں جو ہے وہ کائنڈنیس کے بجائے اوبیڈینس کو ہی سمجھا گیا ہے کہ اس میں شادی سے لے کر طلاق تک بہت زیادہ انٹرفیئرنس ہوتی ہے پیرنٹس کی اور اس میں ایک روایت ہے جو 
पता नहीं ऑथेंटिक है कि अनऑथेंटिक है जो हजरत इब्राहिम के बारे में कहा जाता है कि या वो इसराइली रवायात हैं कि वो हजरत इब्राहिम जो है वो हजरत इस्माइल के पास विजिट करने के लिए आए तो उनकी बीवी ने दरवाजा खोला तो उन्होंने कहा उन्होंने शिकायत की कुछ उनके बारे में तो उन्होंने जाते हुए उनसे कहा कि मेरा मैसेज उनको देना कि अपनी चौखट बदल दो तो जब हजरत इस्माइल आया और उनकी बीवी ने बताया तो उन्होंने कहा इसका मतलब ये कि तुम्हें तलाक दे दो और उन्होंने तलाक दे दी और दूसरी बार जब फिर उन्होंने दूसरी शादी कर ली और जब दूसरी बार वो आए तो फिर उन्होंने कहा अपनी चौखट को बरकरार रखो तो ये इससे भी लोग कहते हैं कि बीवी तो दूसरी मिल जाएगी वाले तो वही रहेंगे ना तो इसलिए उसको बस उसको यही समझा जाता है कि वो बहुत एक्सप्लाइटेशन में इस चीज को इस्तेमाल किया जाता है कि नहीं जो पेरेंट्स कह रहे हैं तो वो वही करना चाहिए हालांकि गलत है वो काइंडनेस करने को कहा गया उनसे ओबीडियंस तो नहीं कही गई किसी right. और दीन के मामले में भी सारी चीज तो ये रिवायत जो है uh in, a, in when i was teaching to you the course on hadith uh, this was i think a couple of years ago this this whole narrative came under discussion you might need to look at it again this is a very unfounded narrative it has been uh, severely criticized by many authorities and i presented the criticism and sub- added some more to it as well uh, so as far as the narrative is concerned please look up how, how we have already discussed that but primarily the thing that we have to understand is that uh, we have to first start off what the, with what the quran says at not a single place as i just said the word obedience is mentioned in relation to parents everywhere the quran says you treat them with kindness wa bil walidayni ihsana that is what it is said what is said and uh, this uh, whole uh, narrative as i said has been misinterpreted this has been misunderstood and also it is not a reliable narrative uh, yes there is uh, one narrative uh, which is authentically reported and that is uqukul walidain so uquq in arabic means show to show disobedience now when a narrative mentions something which is over and above the quran then we have to interpret it in in the light of the quran so the word obedience is found in this narrative and it is an authentic narrative but if you look at this narrative in the light of the quran it actually refers you or tells you that you must not disobey your parents in the matter of their own rights for example if they need something if it is their, their right to be looked after if their right to be uh, in in a, in a place at a certain period of time whatever their rights are so in in the matter of their rights you must not disobey them you cannot uh, interpret a narrative independent of the quran if the quran is not mentioned the obedience of uh, children then and, and a narrative mentions it that you have you have to understand it in the light of the quran so if you do so the word uquq is like aquq uh, is something which means to disobey so the exact translation would be so if someone says that this narrative does exist the answer would be that it actually refers to disobedience in their own rights and it is not an absolute case of disobedience that is being discussed in this narrative shabnam please go ahead thank you maryam sir ye iddat ke bare mein thoda sa clear karna cha rahi thi sir aapne isse bataya ke iska primary iska maqsad ye determine karna hai ke lady ne child to nahi carry kar rahi सर uh, uh, जैसे कुरान में जैसे अ वुमेन हु इज पास बियरिंग अ चाइल्ड उस जैसी है और तो सर कुरान हल्का सा मेंशन तो कर सकता था क्योंकि सर जहां पे खुद की वो जीनतों का और वो पर्दे वारा के अकाम को तो कुरान ने कहा कि जो एल्डरली लेडीज हैं दे कैन उसको रिलैक्सेशन दी गई है तो सर अगर सिर्फ यही मकसद था फिर कुरान तो बहुत उसको कॉम्प्रिहेंसिव वे में हिंट दे सकता था सर आप काइंडली एक्सप्लेन करें सो दैट इज प्रिसाइसली व्हाट आई सेड आई मीन इफ द पर्पस ऑफ इद्दत वाज बिसाइड्स प्रेगनेंसी और बिसाइड्स एनीथिंग दैट रिलेटेड टू द चाइल्ड इट कुड हैव मेंशनड दैट यू सी ऑन टू ओकेजंस इट हैज मेड इट एब्सोल्युटली क्लियर दैट इट इज बेसिकली टू डिटरमिन द स्टेट ऑफ द वुमन आई मीन whether she is pregnant or not is this whole uh, directive being given first is when surah azab when it is said that if you marry women if you marry women and you divorce them and you have not had any sexual contact with them then there is no iddat for them right there is no iddat this is what this what surah azab says multiple multiple jagahon par zikr hua hai na to sir ye to quran ne kahi nahi kaha ke agar wo quran ne jahan pe beva ki iddat ka hukum diya तो कुरान ने ये नहीं कहा कि अगर वो पास दैट एज है तो फिर उसके लिए इट्स ओके सो दैट डजंट मैटर यू सी एट अनदर इंस्टेंस बिकॉज़ द कुरान इज गिवन दिस दिस प्रिंसिपल स्टेटमेंट दैट द फिलॉसफी ऑफ इद्दत व्हाट एग्जैक्टली इज द फिलॉसफी ऑफ इद्दत 
to determine okay. whether a woman is pregnant or not let me let me finish because you see i, I was just referring to you to, to two verses of the quran which tell yes. us that primarily pregnancy is the purpose of iddat so first was this verse of surah azab which says that if you marry women and you divorce them if you marry women and divorce them if you, and if you have had no sexual contact with them then there is no iddat this is one verse and then in surah talaq the 65th surah of the quran it is said that if a woman is pregnant then her iddat extends to her childbirth. So as soon as the child is born, she it could be born right, uh, I mean, two or three days after the death of, uh, after the divorce period, or it could be five days or five weeks. But as soon as the child is born, the iddat finishes. So these two taken in, 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 uh, in tandem, these two verses clearly show that basically the, the provision for iddat is to determine whether a lady is pregnant or not. And all directives which relate to the divorced lady will analogously extend to a, a widowed lady as well because the situation is the same. In the first case, the husband has severed his relationship because exercising his own decision. And in the second case, he no longer exists in this world because God has exercised his decision and taken him away. In both cases, the husband is not there. So all directives which relate to, uh, uh, to, to the directive of widows will analogously be understood for divorced women, uh, for widowed women as well. The only exception is the extent of Iddah, which is which has been extended by 40 days, which we just discussed earlier on. That for a for a divorced lady, the Iddah is three menstrual cycles, which is 90 days or th three months. But for a widowed lady, it is four months and 10 days. This is the only difference uh, as far as the Iddah is concerned. Otherwise, all directives which are related to the Iddah of a divorced lady will be analogously understood to be present in the case of a widowed lady as well. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, ye, I know I have all these things. I already know. But I was just confused that the Quran has not mentioned that the elderly lady has not mentioned restrictions for the elderly lady. You see, uh, and, and not only the Quran is not mentioned for elderly ladies, it has also not mentioned it. I mean, it's, it, has, it has mentioned this without any rega regard being given to age. For example, if you marry a young lady and you have not had sexual contact with her and you divorce her, the Quran says there will be no iddat. And it, regardless of the age, so you see the Quran does not mention age in the case of marriage. It says that whether the lady is young, whether she is old, whatever the age, once you divorce her and there is no sexual contact with her, then you will have she will have to uh, undergo no period of iddat. Obviously, if she has passed her marriageable age, that is a given that in that case, iddat cannot be even observed because she she cannot be pregnant because of biological reasons. But in the case of biological reasons in which she can be pregnant, the Quran says if there is no sexual contact with, between the husband and the wife, then there shall be no iddat. So this is such a clear uh, directive of the Quran that I think that we need to uh, revisit and and pay heed to it. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, very much, much. Dr. Salim. This matter, Ms. Ahmed, please go ahead. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Salim. Um, right. So my my question is that, you know, in the case of disobedience of the parents and then also in the case of dawar, where a man is supposed to uh, give dawar to his wife as a symbol that he'll mm -hmm. take care of her. Plus, I think you mentioned in the earlier lectures also a few weeks ago that if a man has given her gifts and she wants to take a divorce and if that can be given as ransom. So in every case, it seems it's the man who's giving her things. She's not bringing anything from her parents' house. How did the cultural shift or the religious shift that people that Malvi's preach happened that both these cases of disobedience to the parents and the gifts that the woman is supposed to bring from her house, the dawar is supposed to be her responsibility. How did that happen? Because Islam seems to be very modern in both these aspects, from what I understand. This has much to do with culture. So you see, uh, you, there is a difference between dawar and dowry. So you must not confuse that. So dawar is meher and dowry is jahez. So the Quran okay. does not speak of jahez in any way. That, that is dowry. And that is something which is part of the Eastern culture, uh, in the, the subcontinent culture. It has nothing to do with the Quran. And uh, the Quran, uh, when it says you have to pay the dower, uh, it actually refers to the meher. So dowry and dower are two different things. First, this is important. And the other important thing is that as far as uh, uh, culture is concerned, it has influenced people. Uh, on many occasions and uh, uh, as far as jahez or dowry is concerned, this is again something which is very, very purely cultural and uh, 
to the people from subcontinent they particularly are very protected uh, of their daughters and they also think that they might not be given a share later on in their inheritance uh, by themselves or even be deprived by their husbands so it has become a mental psyche for them to safeguard and protect their rights they would think that well this is something uh, that should be done although i think it's a i mean if you ask me personally i, I feel it a very to be a very shameful thing that you ask uh, for a woman to bring home all the amenities and gadgets uh, which the husband is actually supposed to provide uh, as far as religion is concerned I mean, he he might not be able to provide everything but whatever he is able to provide it is his responsibility and not the responsibility uh, in any case of the of the daughter or the or the wife that he is bringing home to bringing all those gadgets i think it has got much to do with culture especially the subcontinent culture mm. and the the civilians aspect also Dr. Sarima, I feel it is, dis- a, it yeah. is actually as far, the, the, as, far is, as the disobedience aspect is concerned. I think it is because of misunderstanding the narrative I, which I just uh, referred to you. There is one narrative which says "ukukul walidain," which means disobedience to the parents. And okay. the uh, the second thing which the which has caused this misconception is the word "uf." Falatakullahuma ufin. You see, in Surah Bani Israel, the verse says, "Do not say uf to your parents." Now, in the Urdu language, when you say do not, don't say off to your parents, it means that you don't disobey them. You don't speak to them. Whenever they decide something, you just uh, follow, you just acquiesce. So, the, I would say the major reason for the fact that disobedience has become a part of our culture is also because not understanding the fact that off here is used in Arabic. And in Arabic, the word off doesn't mean to, to show disobedience. It actually means to show disrespect. So the oof of Arabic and the oof of Urdu are two different things. So here primarily the misinterpretation of the word oof is one reason. And the second is that narrative which says ukukul walidain in which uh, disobedience to the, uh, to the parents is regarded to be a, uh, something of a vice. Uh, and that narrative is authentic. So I've already explained that as, as far as the Quran is concerned, the word oof doesn't mean disobedience. And as far as ukukul walidain in that hadith is concerned, it does not refer to the absolute disobedience. It refers to disobedience regarding the rights of the parents not the rights of the of the grown up child himself or herself because how can he they he, he this is not showing disobedience because you see obviously when he is showing disobedience it could only be something which relates to the rights of the parents something which is his own right something which he is responsible for his own self or her own self uh, this cannot be classified in any way as ukuk or disobedience and it is here that has that narrative or hadith has been misunderstood Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Slim. We're running very short on time, so I'd request the remaining participants to keep themselves to one quick question. Baran Nashur, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My question was about uh, disobeying your parents in the regards of if there are differences in religion, like if they have like mm-hmm. uh, a different view on religion than me, for example. And it creates more fitna or like chaos inside the house. Would that uh, would it then be considered like quote unquote haram or prohibited to do certain acts if it causes more fitna inside of the house and causes sadness or anger within your parents? Like it's a very. I think it is the it, it, if it is fitna, then the reason I mean the the means to curb that fitna is not that the children should abstain. It is for the to the for the parents to realize that they are crossing their limits in stopping their children from taking a decision. If if it is fitna, the fitna is not being caused by the child or by the grown up uh, boy or girl who is taking a decision. It is actually caused by the parents who are overstepping their boundaries. They are trying to stop something uh, forcibly, of something which of which they have no right to do so. So basically, the parents have to realize that they are overstepping. They are crossing the limits. Uh, because a grown-up child has the prerogative, the free will to to do whatever he or she would like with his own li- uh, his or her own life. Yes, out of respect of your, I mean, and I would not call it respect. Uh, it could be that if the if the parents are not realizing this, then just to create that pleasant uh, atmosphere in the house, if a child withdraws from his or her demand to marry, it could be a call as a as a very as a, as a compromise by him, but it is certainly not something which religion asks him to do. I mean, he can do it for the to keep peace amongst uh, in the household or to maintain comfort. 
But this should not be the case that if he doesn't do this, then this is something that he would be going against religion in any way. Because religion gives him the right to do what he uh, would like to do. That is something which is a given. But in order to strike a compromise, in order to for, uh, not, not go ahead, so if he was not doing this, he is just stepping back and withdrawing from his own right. I mean, he is making a further sacrifice. And this sacrifice must not be classified that it is something that he must do. Because what must be done is the parents should not actually overstep their uh, authority and, uh, and uh, they should remain within that authority, which is that they can, they, they can suggest to their child, their grown-up child, they can share their experience, but they cannot forcibly stop him. Yeah, for but for example, if uh, I went to Umrah and my parents did not want me to shave my head, would it then be uh, uh, prohibited for me to shave my head as it is a sunnah act? Like you are not for you are not. Uh, no, I mean, shaving the head is part or... is is part of the hajj. It is part of the hajj ritual. Either you shave your head or you have a haircut. A parents parents don't have a say in this regard. I mean, whether you would like to have a haircut or you must, or you would like to shave off your head completely, is a prerogative, is a right which the person who is doing umrah uh, or uh, or offering umrah is concerned. I mean, as far as the parents are concerned, they can express their desire. I mean, they could express their wish, but they cannot uh, simply <laughs> start stopping him forcibly. Or show uh, distaste, or, or or express the fact that well, that they're going to be angry if they do so. Again, this would be overstepping their limits. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Slim. We have a chat question that asks: It's often overemphasized that women are to be provided for by their husbands. At the same time, the wife's inheritance share is minimal. Could the emphasis on man being the provider? Be misleading and put women in a precarious situation financially and unmet expectations in a married relationship. Well, I think this is again a misunderstanding because, uh, as far as the Quran is concerned, it has made absolutely clear that women are not vulnerable at all. In fact, they are the most protected. But if the husband does not discharge his rights, does not carry out his rights, does not fulfill his obligations, it's not the, uh, I mean, the Quran or the uh, Islam does not stand at fault because. If someone is not following what religion tells him, it is basically he or that person that has to be uh, taken account of, but not the Quran, because the Quran is given this complete protection and this position of uh, vulnerability has been totally done away with, because this protection, uh, see how far it goes. We've just discussed this, that not only in his own lifetime is he bound to provide uh, financially to his wife, and this financial pr provision, uh, mind you, also covers any pocket money, any personal expense that uh, she needs to be that she needs to meet. It does not cover the household expenses. Uh, maintenance primarily refers to the expenses that a wife needs for her own maintenance and sustenance. So this is what the Quran has said in his own life, and we have just seen in the case of the widows that this responsibility extends for one year, even one, once that person passes away. So he should write a will that if I pass away, then what I am giving to my wife today shall stand continued till for one more year so that in that one year she's not left high and dry she can take a decision for of her life and she has this one one whole year to take that decision such is the protection which uh, the quran gives in this regard to 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 wives so i don't I, I don't see how the quran can be blamed in any way i think it is more either misinterpreting certain verses of the quran or being a slave to one's culture that just happens otherwise uh, uh, I think uh, if you just, uh, if you can just point out any directive which gives this vulnerability to women, uh, um, I don't think that you would be able to because in all such respects, it is basically that protection which the Quran has given women. And remember, the Quran was revealed in a society in which these rights were totally flouted. And I do remember many years ago, this is about maybe 25 years ago, that Time magazine, uh, they it actually flashed once a whole story about uh, women and the subjugation of women and uh, a lot of things that it said uh, didn't, didn't, I mean, of course, uh, were, were against the Quran. I mean, it was basically criticizing the stance of the Quran. But the point it made, uh, which is something which, uh, which is accepted uh, by them as well, by our, by our critics as well, is that it said that the Quran was the most revolutionary document in its own times regarding the rights of women. It gave them those protective rights which the Arab Jahiliya society or even many other societies 
uh, they failed to give women even in those times. So I think even the most fierce critics of Islam do acknowledge this. Yes, I mean, there could be violations of this, uh, this narrative or directive, or this could be misunderstanding, or it could be, as I said, culture getting the better of religion. But if you view religious directives purely uh, on the basis of uh, what is being said, I think this is the most protective thing that can be given to women, uh, whether in the lifetime or whether after it. There's further clarification from the participant that says that the financial, uh, the expenses, the housing expenses that are going to be provided to the widow is only for a year, which is not a very secure financial plan. So this suggests that mm -hmm. the financial right. security for women is primarily only when she's in a married relationship. So you see, as far as women are concerned, in a married relationship, they are dependent on their husbands. Outside of their marriage, they are now free to choose. You see, a natural way for women to live, uh, I mean, if you go by nature, is to marry again. And at the same time, if they would like to remain uh, independent, then there's always the chance that uh, most women today, they are professional women. Uh, in case of financial dependency, uh, this professionalism actually go, uh, does away with that as well. So if women have to be financially dependent and as a result, they would like to marry or maybe for protection or certain other emotional reasons, that could be a given. But other than that, if women today are professional the way they are, uh, this dependence on financial or finances of the husband is done away with. So I think this has also to be understood that uh, today that it has become all the more easier. And if you talk about the past, remember the dynamics of the past were different. Women, uh, they were not professionals 100 years ago. They were dependent on their husbands and they accepted this. And normally once this was, would happen that a, a husband would pass away and a year would go by, they would marry again. And this is what the purpose of the Quran is, that you should start your life again. Why should uh, someone who is, uh, who's, I mean, whose partnership you've lost uh, be a means to deprive you eternally of that partnership of some other person? Thank you for that clarification, Dr. Salim Shaban Ansari. Last question of the day. Please go ahead. ڈاکٹر صاحب جو اس میں ان آیات میں یتیموں کی بہبود کے لیے جو کہا کہ تین تین اور چار چار شادیاں کرنے کا تو اس وقت تو وہ معاشرہ ایسا تھا جہاں جنگیں ہو رہی تھیں اور بیوہ ہو رہے تھے لوگ اور بچے جو ہے یتیم ہو رہے تھے تو وہ ایک کرائسس مینجمنٹ کا طریقہ لگ رہا تھا تو اب آج کے دور میں اس کو کس طرح ریلیٹ کریں گے کیونکہ ہمارے معاشرے میں تو جو مرد ہیں وہ چاہے اسلام کو ذرا سا بھی فالو نہ کریں لیکن اس حکم کو بہت خوشی خوشی لیتے ہیں اور وہ کہتے ہیں کہ ہمیں تو اجازت ہے چار شادیوں کی اور پہلی بیوی سے چھپ کے دوسری کرتے ہیں دوسری سے چھپ کے تیسری کرتے ہیں اور اس کو بہت اسلام سمجھتے ہیں کہ بے شک ادھر رول ہو کہ آپ کو اجازت لینی ہے اس کو آپ کیسے ریلیٹ کریں گے کیونکہ وہاں تو وہ کرائسس مینجمنٹ کے لیے تھے تو اب جو کر رہے ہوتے ہیں وہ کوئی بیوہ اور متعلقہ سے تھوڑی کر رہے ہوتے ہیں شادی وہ تو اپنی پسند کی کر رہے ہوتے ہیں اور تین تین اور چار چار کر رہے ہوتے ہیں اور بیوی کو اندھیرے میں رکھ رہے ہوتے ہیں اس کے بارے میں آپ کیسے اس کو ریلیٹ کریں گے حکم کو سو وی ہیو ڈسکس دس ان ڈیٹیل وین وی ویر ڈسکسنگ دا ٹاپک آف پولیگمی سم ویکس اگو پولیگمی بیکاز دیز ورسز ور ڈسکس ونس اگین اینڈ دے فگر دیٹ ڈسکشن از ویل اینڈ آئی میرے کلیئر دیٹ اسلام از ناٹ امپوزنگ دس کنڈیشن دیٹ یو کین اونلی میری فار دا پرپز آف دا ویلفیئر آف دی آرفنس In pre-Islamic Arabian society, uh, women were, ma I mean, uh, men would marry more than one woman. I mean, they would have multiple wives, seven, eight, nine, ten, or eleven. So this was something which is already in vogue. So the Quran was just taking taking advantage of this this whole uh, institution of polygamy, and it was telling them that you marry for various purposes. You marry for your own self. You marry for this and for that. But let this also be one basis of your marriage that you support orphans by marrying their mothers. So the Quran is, I mean, not saying this, that you can only marry for the purpose of the welfare of the orphans. This is not what it's saying. It is basically saying that you marry for various reasons. And amongst those various reasons, you add one more reason, and that is for the welfare of the orphans. So what it actually effectively is saying is that marrying another wife is an option that you have. It is not an obligation. It is not an exhortation. I mean, the Quran is not encouraging people to marry more than one wife, and it is not in any way exhorting them or urging them or regarding this to be an obligation. It is just telling them that polygamy is something that mankind always indulge in. And it has now curtailed that polygamy that now you can only marry uh, for the purpose of, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, for the purpose of administering justice amongst those wives and also that it should not exceed four. So basically what the Quran is telling us is this, that you can use this custom. 
And as I said, it is not in any way encouraging people the way you have just said that men think that they are being told that, well, they have this prerogative. They don't. I mean, it's not that the Quran is telling them that this is something. It's just offering them an option that you do so for various reasons. And this is one reason that you can add to that. But if you do so, then justice must reign supreme and it should not be for. And the other thing important here is that if there is a law of the land that you cannot marry uh, a second woman or a second time without the permission of the first uh, wife, then this must be respected. And I have seen people uh, disrespecting this or hiding this directive, which is not correct. In whichever country there is this law that you have to seek permission of the first wife, it should be followed because this also is based on wisdom. Because if you marry a second time, then there is always a chance that a great rift will result. And if the first wife is has that consent uh, or gives you that consent, that it would mean that at, at least you can now peacefully have a second wife and the first wife, and especially not the first wife, I would say the children of the first wife will not be against you. So I think it's in the fitness of things if there is a, this law made in a country, like for example, we have this law in certain countries, then it should be respected. And the third thing that I'd like to express here is that keeping a marriage a secret is against something which is against uh, the, the very meaning of the word nikah. So word, the word nikah in Arabic means an open declaration, an open declaration, which means the society should know that a woman and a man are living as a wife and a husband. So it should be a known uh, phenomenon in the society. It's not, it should not be a hidden. Marriages cannot be covert. They have to be overt. They have to be known in the society. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. Um, we got another question just now. If you can, should, can we take yeah, please it? Please go ahead. Yes. Akram Bhatti, please go ahead. And this will be our final question. Yeah, there's a small comment. Uh, sir, in, in Western societies where the second marriage is not allowed, people marry and actually they they hurt the, you know, know. the right of right of the woman because they, they cannot yes. uh, you know, mm. give the money. And mm -hmm. you know, they are not part of the of the of their uh, you know inheritance. So I think mm -hmm. they, you know they, they they that's not correct, but they do it a lot. And they, yes, they I know that. Yeah. And it is, it's a pathetic thing. It's a very sorry state of affairs. Uh, I see very respectable people uh, marrying a second time in the United States and many other countries in which second marriage is prohibited, and they don't uh, declare this marriage in the papers. They don't declare it anywhere. It's just like a personal settlement between. Uh, a second person or a second wife that they 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 marry. I have even seen people who are very re realistically inclined. They think that well, if the Sharia has given them this uh, this permission, uh, then if, then it is fine, and uh, uh, they can flout the law of the land. Whereas we have to know that the law of the land, according to Sharia, has to be respected. You yes. cannot uh, yes. just go against the law of the land. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Doctor Sleep, for another incredible session and for clarifying a lot of these um, issues that are deep in our society. So, so inshallah, see you in tomorrow's session and assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.